So, Allison, I want to thank you for debuting new work with us. Um, because I know when we originally had spoken, um, we were thinking about some of work from your fabulous, you have so many great bodies of work. So there's, you know, there's, even if you didn't create a new piece, it, it would be fabulous no matter what. So, but I, I think, you know, the fact that um, Nawi and David created new work, I think kind of made you a little bit more, well, okay. And mm -hmm. as, and, um, as I, if artists who've worked with me here and elsewhere now, it's really about supporting your, the artist's vision. It's not the curatorial vision. I mean, I have a framework, but really the only reason I have a job is because someone else made art. And being a working artist, I really feel strongly about that. So I'm, I believe in supporting people's visions. And you need places to try out new things to see if they work or not. So I'm just ecstatic. So <laughs> um, thank you for making that leap and, and trusting us to um, show new work from you. Just. It's just great. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And as I said, I've been stalking you for many years, so I feel really excited about that. So, thank you. Um, so your show is part of this later, later time series. It was originally a group show. Um, can you share how you think about time and how it manifests in your work? Sure, sure. First, I do want to say thank you so much for um, your openness and support in letting me show new work. Uh, new work that I really, it's so new I don't, really have the language around it totally yet. And I really appreciate that you were so open to walking through that process with me and, and making this a reality, which I'm very excited about. It was funny, <laughs> just so you know, like usually when I work with artists, I go and do studio visits mm -hmm. and we have long conversations and we might go to dinner and talk. So this was a really, it was a harder process because your images were still. So it's hard right. to get a sense of the moving image where like when David and Nawi sent me stuff, I couldn't get a sense of the skill, but I could see the work and we the conversation mm -hmm. was, it was a different conversation. So it was it was new for me to be able to write about it and how to make sure I got it right. What I was so I want to thank you for bearing with me on that piece of it because it is a different way of, mm -hmm. of interacting. So um, you know, time and how you think about right. it and just what I'm just curious. Yeah, absolutely. I mean I have what I wrote, but I you think it you said it's kind of correct, but you maybe other <laughs> stuff I didn't get with that. Yeah. You know? Um I work in time-based media and for me, the movement and movement, of course, takes place over time is is really important for me in my work. It's part of how I create ambiance and a feeling and emotion. My work is really, I believe, meditative in a way and rhythmic, and that really relies on time in order to do that. I also feel like my work is comes from a very intimate and spiritual place, mm -hmm. which also, I believe, communicates within breaking down ideas about time, about the past, about present, about future, and merging those together mm -hmm. and making a statement about, not even making a statement, but opening up the possibility of seeing things differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, you know, you work in different scales, right? So this yes. is a different scale than the sometimes a very personal scale that people can mm -hmm. interact. So I think, um, and also then you even larger scale. So I think that's, you know, like with any medium, there's different ways you have to do that, or mm -hmm. you hope that it will be succeed. So that's another thing that I'm, we can talk about a little bit more. Um, so this work is so much is about your climate change, what we're doing to the to the to our planet, to ourselves. I love your mask, by the way, about the universe because <laughs> we're part of this whole cosmos. And people tend to forget that we're all made of stardust. Um, can you? But. It, it, you know, there's interconnectivity with our existence, but this visually is a little different, mm -hmm. right? And that was the conversation, like, I don't know about this. I'm like, yeah. just go for it. I'm like, I don't know, you know, because again, <laughs> if people, if you've been stalking her or following her work, you realize when you see her work, you come into this whole the magical world of lasers. It feels like you're swimming through all this kind of imagery, like mm -hmm. literally swimming through it. Um, and this is this is different for you. So mm -hmm. do you want to? Do you feel comfortable talking about that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was nervous about presenting this work because it doesn't involve nearly as much um, manipulation and digital creation that I usually use. This particular image here does involve that, but the rest of them are very much straightforward images. And that's not generally what I what I present. I kind of construct, I construct the images almost from a non-existent place. Right. But when I had this experience, which um, I was volunteering, working with um, leatherback turtles, uh, turtle hatchlings in Costa Rica. And oh, we oh, found out, the biologists um, at the station that I was working at found out that a blue whale had, had died. 
and was on the shore at a nearby beach. And they stated that it was all of, we're so excited that it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to see something right. this big, that close. And it, it is, but there's like a tension in that statement about it being a once in a lifetime right, right, right. opportunity because right. it, it's also not a quote unquote natural opportunity, right. <laughs> I suppose. Um, but in, in having that experience of being in the presence of this, I didn't feel it right to approach it in the same way that I'd approached previous material. I felt like this is a memorial to this particular whale and it's a bearing witness of this moment. Mm -hmm. And for me to have inserted too much of my kind of um, magical realist constructions around it would be a disservice to the work. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, when you think about it, it's a very sad and somber moment when yeah, you think it does. about it, yeah. you know, and also, um, yeah, I mean, it's just the tenuous cycle of life, but how much we're pushing that cycle mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. extent. And I, you know, a little bit about the gray, you pick the gray, I mean, call it, it's anchor gray, which mm -hmm. we have, us humans, particularly um, non-Indigenous human beings, um, have a real play in the extinction of, almost extinction of these beautiful animals. Mm -hmm. And there are so many of them in that so many different types of whales. So I think that is a brilliant move. I remember we were having the conversation about the about color, and I said, "Well, are you going to pick it?" Because you know, when I pick colors, the name has something to do with what I'm doing in some way. And I, and I, and I, it it, I fi it finds its way. These things finds mm -hmm. its way when your choices happen. You yeah, know? I feel like you definitely the way that you talked about that was so much more profound than I was thinking about it when I was making it. Right. I was like, aesthetically, this looks good with this. Right. Right. <laughs> but then right. you were like, wait a minute, it has this other meaning, and I'm like, oh yeah, you're right, it does. But again, I would so, never have thought. But, but that, that does. But you did see it. You mm -hmm. just didn't see it. Yeah. Right. So you're intuitively going there. This is what we're speaking about earlier about the work that happens here. If you're plugged into where you're supposed to be, you get there and it reveals itself. Absolutely. That's how art works. That's how the creative works. I mean, that's how nature works. It's mm -hmm. just these kind of, it reveals itself when you're ready to hear or see it or someone will tell you about it or our helper will do that. Absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your artistic practice? How, if you do research, how you do your found historical images, how you choose them, you know, when you do do the layering imagery, mm -hmm. like you chose this one, mm -hmm. do that. We can talk about the frame that you're using because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, there's always biographical, autobiographical on how you tie all those together, or weave these fabulous images that we look at. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just play off the way we were talking before about um, kind of intuitive knowing and moving mm -hmm. through an artistic process. And it, you were, how you worded it, it was being open or being mm -hmm. in the moment? Yep. Or I'm not yeah, sure you said it exactly. It's like the muse. Yeah. That's how they explain the muses. That's how the muses work. Yeah, and I feel like that is a big part of my process. Like mm -hmm. I have to be kind of open to seeing possibilities and making connections. And a lot of it is in the initial stages going with my gut mm -hmm. and just feeling connections between things, having an intimate connection with something. Then my work does get very technical mm -hmm. at a particular point, especially because of the kinds of um, work that I do, not in this piece per mm -hmm. se, but in a lot of my other work where I'm working like frame by frame, digitally mm -hmm. compositing. Mm -hmm. So like 24 frames a second, it's a right. lot of <laughs> tedious work. Um, but it comes from this sort of like very impulsive, free flowing sort of um, artistic process is where it starts. I do do a lot of research mm -hmm. that combines both learning about, especially um, animals. I use a lot of archival footage of extinct animals in my work. Mm -hmm. Not in this one per se, right. but um, I do. And th that there's a part of it that's research for kind of like the conceptual aspects of my work, but there's also an aesthetic aspect to that research because mm -hmm. I am moved by that imagery. Mm -hmm. Like how I choose particular archival footage to work with is because I feel some sort of connection to it. Mm -hmm. And I try to bring that in for the viewer. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your autobiographical reference? Because I mean, this frame for these two is is a frame that you yeah. have a deep connection to. Yeah, yeah. So I think all all art is autobiographical, even if it does not present or look or speak in that particular way. It comes from a subjective position of that artist. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's always autobiographical. Um, I often take the step 
further um, and <laughs> actually include material. Um, this, these images are from photos from Cuba of my family, but I took the yeah. frames. Yeah. yeah, I actually took the frames from old images that I had scanned in and put them around the, um, the wide shots of the whales, the whale. And I feel like that lends this familial quality to it. Mm -hmm. Like we are part of the same family, mm -hmm. the, the, the planet and us and the whale, all part of this family. So I'm acknowledging that connection and that intimacy that I feel towards these animals. Um, and I think that that's part of what I try to do with my work overall is create the possibility of people experiencing an intimate moment with something that they might not previously have connected with. Mm -hmm. I also like the choices how you've made the sky mm -hmm. and then everything else is like blanched out like what you would do if you were you know, doing a black light photography or how you would do that so mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit more about that choice because this is very has some more surreal essence right. but that's kind of how it visually right. leads but also it's this kind of one layer like maybe one of the first layers we'd see in some of your other work and then you layer more right so right right if there's any layers in those it's simply color based right. Um, right. I think that that does bring a sort of magical quality to it. It mm -hmm. does. It also plays into the idea of nostalgia and old family photographs. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it also lends a surreal quality, which I use a lot in my work, this idea of presenting something as fantastic in order to draw attention to how fantastic it actually is. Mm -hmm. So. So I see it as magical. So I'm going to add these elements in order to have you see it as magical too, mm -hmm. I suppose. And um, so it's not like I'm creating something magical. I'm just bringing it forward a little bit. So um, when you, whenever you kind of bring family into things, how do they? Are they? Is your family aware <laughs> of that? Are they? Are they I mean, yeah. I, my family, whether the, well, my brother, whether he likes or not, but my mom is actively happy to be involved. My brother gets this kind of laughs, like, here we go again. <laughs> but um, how, I mean, how does, how does that work? I don't, is your family here? Or how do, how um, do... Most of the, most of the relatives that are in the images that I use have passed. Um, my immediate family supports my work, but the, only my kind of siblings really Understand interact it. with it conceptually, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. It's kind of this, <laughs> but they, yeah. they yeah. support it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because it can be hard, you know, it's technology and how that is. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're happy, they have that. But it's just <laughs> interesting because um, in Medicine Will, if you've come to any of our events, oftentimes Michael's mother, who is a celebrity in her own right, will be here and is very supportive of artists and process. So it's a way that family, they are involved with your work. Mm -hmm. So I just right. wanted to honor that too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about social engaged practice, I come from a um, startup photographer, documentary photography, and there's, there's ethics that you're supposed to follow. The same thing with public policy, right? But um, you're, you really are social engaged with your practice. It's not just you're just calling attention. You're like Earth Watch, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how outside of this work, I mean, you were down there helping shepherd leatherback turtles to get to where they need to go. Can you speak a little bit about that? Because it's really, you and now we kind of share that yeah. with your work. Um, I think for me, it's, it's really about um, how I understand myself as mm -hmm. a being in this world. Oh, yeah. yeah. When I talk about, even though I grew up religious, I, I wasn't, I have not been spiritual or religious for many years, but I came back to spirituality through nature, through engaging with the natural world. Mm -hmm. And that lended itself into my art. So I believe, sorry, are we, are we still going okay? okay? Yeah. <laughs> We're good. Um, I kind of lost track of You're that. talking about spirituality, how you... Yeah, so yeah. it's sort of how I understand my place in the world. And a lot of um, folks will ask me, how do you deal with such heavy content mm -hmm. in your work? How do you manage that? And it's like, that is how I deal with such heavy content in right. the world. Right. It's how I engage with it. It's how I process it. So there is a part of this work that is selfish and about me in that I need to work these things out in some way. And, and I create in order to do that. Um, so yes, I do do volunteer work and, and, and try to do as much as I can engaging with these issues. But the work itself, I think, is about um, more about this idea of shifting consciousness mm -hmm. than about 
documenting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in not necessarily like teaching folks how to how to be better humans on the planet as much as through my work, creating this idea that we need to shift our colonial perspective to the landscape. We need mm -hmm. to shift this human centered way of seeing mm -hmm. life. So I'm kind of try trying to create opportunities and moments in which people can be open to that idea. Right. So that's more the work, whereas I kind of leave the some of the other components to other artists that are doing those sorts of things, I suppose. You talk about your involvement with Earth Watch because you've done residencies, you've mm -hmm. done volunteering, and you talk about, that's that kind of, yeah. what I'm saying, your practice is that's part of your practice. Right, like, right. One of my mm -hmm. pet peeves, when people say it's social engagement, it really isn't, they're just calling attention to something, they don't, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how they're doing, they're actually, I don't want to use the word exploiting, but they're using that subject matter to put themselves into a dialogue with contemporary art versus mm -hmm. them actually mm -hmm, doing mm -hmm. activists to help change what they're showing, right? Um, they don't always connect. So anyway, that's one of my little pet peeves about <laughs> social media practice. But you and Nawi particularly live what you do and what you show. Mm. And I, I, I want to call that out because that's really, I think, how it should be if you're going to see your social engaged artist. I'm, <laughs> that's, that's the piece that needs to be there if you're going to be saying mm -hmm. that. So can you tell me how you got involved with Earthwatch? Because it's, it's, yeah. I think it's, they're a great organization. Yeah, they are a great organization. And it's kind of a really strange story. Um, my sister-in-law saw this residency in the Arctic and thought that I would be a really good fit for it. And she sent it to me. And I looked at it and I was like, I don't qualify for that. And she was like, hmm, I wonder if there's a residency you do qualify for. And um, she sent my work to this scientist in Churchill, Manitoba. My sister-in-law works for Earthwatch. Oh, okay. And the scientist really liked my work a lot. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I want to bring her here. And Earthwatch was like, well, we happen to have this communications fellowship that we haven't granted anyone yet. If um, the Churchill Northern Study Center will take care of your expenses there, we will get you there. Mm. And then I was also a part of the Earthwatch fellowship there, which involved working alongside teachers mm -hmm. um teaching from grade school up through high school um wanting to actually experience working with climate change so mm -hmm. that they can bring kind of like that experience-based learning to their classrooms mm -hmm. so i was the only artist in this group mm -hmm. um but that experience was life-changing mm -hmm. it was life-changing on so many ways and just earthwatch has been a great organization that has continued to support me and i've continued to do as much as i can to support them as well so this Costa Rica trip was also, um, it wasn't a fellowship. I was just going to, right, to, do, to do volunteer work. Right. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's funny with you and Nawi, you guys probably have a lot to talk about because even her daily practice, what she does around water and um, where she was in residence also was really specific to her maps, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this, and I didn't know all that background either, right? So as a curator, like I may not know it, but I knew it by the, again, mm -hmm. you lead and you figure it out, right? Um, I think to people forget like things aren't just, a lot of times we compartmentalize our lives and our world. And as artists, sometimes you have to do it, but oftentimes it, you can't, it just kind of all comes together, right? So I think this, you kind of live your work if you really are connected to it. And I think this is the other piece of socially engaged where, um, and it also allows the work to fit in different places, right? So it doesn't mm. need to also be in the art space, right? It could be in the right. aquarium. It could be somewhere else. Because right. that that kind of, the way you're open to it, you're open to it to be other places mm -hmm. too, to find other. Because not many people can or do go to art spaces. I think we right. we have sometimes have this illusion of grandeur that we're these great, well, we are great, but not everyone's going to come here mm -hmm. to see fabulous work. So how do you make sure work can be with other people, right? So this, I think this again, what you're doing by them meeting an artist, by being a residency, helps bring the worlds together in a way that's really important and which I wish there was more of that happening, right? Yeah, I do too. Um, so you're in another group show, right? You wanna talk about yeah. that? Yeah, um, so I'm in a show right now called A Thread Extended, which is a three person show at Northeastern University at Gallery 360. And the installation I have there is called All That Moves and it's actually, about the landscape of Churchill, Manitoba. So it is very site specifically about that space, the connection I felt to that space, the history of that space, um, and kind of like a visceral experience I had in 
seeing what is often unseen. I feel like in a landscape like Churchill, which is very stark because it's right at the Arctic, mm -hmm. it's right at the Arctic's edge, um, you see the human imprint on the land in a way that you don't see in an urban, I mean, obviously we have, we've imprinted yeah. the land, but you see it sort of like starkly highlighted out in a vast open terrain. And um, so sort of like seeing these potentially unseen elements in a place in the world that not a lot of people visit, um, I just had a very um, profound connection to that. And the work is centered around kind of that experience and exploring Churchill as a place, but also the relationship between Churchill and Boston, so between one place and another place. And the gallery is called what? Gallery? Gallery 360. Okay. And it's curated by Amy Halliday. Great. So we actually have people here in the gallery <laughs> space, which is very exciting. So I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions, if they want to have any questions or comments. Um, we're happy to take those, and then we can go to the folks who are in the virtual realm. Anybody have any comments? Oh, yeah, Susan. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, Allison, about the, you're talking about the frame. Mm -hmm. do, do you mean the, the paper, the scalloped edge paper? Yes. Because the, as soon as I saw these, I went immediately back to my family photographs yes. in my mind. Yes. And those old photographs mm -hmm. that were scalloped edge, mm -hmm. and I was sort of like, wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah, so that's... That's exactly what I meant. And I have another project called In the Presence of Absence that is all about my old family uh -huh. photographs. And I noticed that, that people will walk into it and it doesn't matter that their culture is completely different than mine or their background is completely different than mine. They see these archival images and it connects them to their own family. Yeah. So thereby I'm allowed to have a conversation with them about what I'm talking about while their family is already in their mind. <laughs> so right. it's, it's sort of... Um, it's something I kind of learned from that work that the kind of acknowledging the connection I feel allows others to do that as well, yeah, I suppose. That's fantastic. Thank I, you. I just wanted to say one other thing, if I, if I may. Sure. <laughs> um, I, <clears throat> I was wondering about the juxtaposition of these baby mm -hmm. live turtles trying to survive, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the whale, mm -hmm. the dead whale. Um, I don't know what I want to say about that, but <clears throat> just it's just something that I observed and mm -hmm. I can probably were thinking about. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. And um, I'm not totally sure how to articulate it yet either. There's something <laughs> that is profoundly beautiful and profoundly sorrowful yes. about all of this, uh, about the whale itself, that once in a lifetime opportunity to see it. Um, these little turtles struggling to reach the water, mm -hmm. about one out of a thousand actually makes it to adulthood. Mm -hmm. They get shoved back, but then they keep going and they keep going. And there's something about their struggle and our struggle that I see in parallel and also like the fragility of life and existence, but how it's all interconnected. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yep. I have a question about your experience as a filmmaker. Okay. What when you think of this work, do you think of like the whole story about what happened before when you were there leading up to it and then what happened afterwards? Or is it, you know, for us, it's kind of, we just see this mm -hmm. moment and we're, anyway, I'm just, and then I'm thinking about time-based for you, what happened before? What right, happened? right. So the way that my, my experience of time unfolded while I shot this. Um, I think that I was working with the turtle hatchlings, with the sea turtle hatchlings. So for me, I was seeing a lot of this. And that was already moving me in a very profound way. So I think that seeing this and then that made a connection for me um, that happened over time. But I don't, I don't know that I'm tr trying to convey something linear to folks when I present it this way, I suppose. Um, part of the reason I eat, I shot like nothing while I was there because I was volunteering, I was actually working. But when I heard that we were gonna go look at this whale, we were gonna drive like over two hours, three hours or something to go see it. I was like, I'm gonna bring my camera because I really don't wanna do this. <laughs> so it sort of almost allowed me this, um, this distancing mm -hmm. from it because I was able to observe it and know I knew I was in a profound moment when it was happening. 
Um, and because I had had this other experience already, they connected for me. Um, so I guess when I present them together, I, I, I bring that, that all that coming together from me to it. Yeah, does that answer your question? Because I know you're a filmmaker too, so you think about things um, in a particular uh, practice and making kind of way of constructing time-based work. <laughs> So I'm going to go and see if there's anybody online. I see Claudia Ravish shares. So hi, Claudia. I'm saying hello to you. Um, I don't know who else is there because it's too far away from who else is to welcome. But is there anybody who wants to ask a question that's watching us? Can you guys handle that and let us know what it is over there? Yeah, I have a question from David. David who? David Lloyd Brown. David Lloyd oh, Brown. Hi, David. Hey! How are you? Okay. Oh, there you are, Hi, David. David. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Sorry. So, David asked Allison, can you outline what your work was with the Hanson Turtles? Was this a recovery operation? Um, it was specifically working with leatherback um, sea turtles, although there were other kinds of sea turtles there as well. And there were a lot of tasks that we had. We had to patrol the beach at night, like all night long, in different groups in order to see if a tortoise came on and laid her eggs because we needed to relocate the eggs. So we would kind of oversee that she carefully made it to the beach, was able to lay her eggs, and then she would leave, and then we would move them to what was called kind of like a nursery, where we would keep them safe under watch 24 hours a day so that nothing dug them up and destroyed them and until they were ready to hatch, and then we would bring them to the water and release them so that they would, would do this. Um, there were some other tasks that involved kind of like soil testing and things like that, but but basically kind of patrolling the beach, <laughs> moving the nest, moving the um, the eggs, and seeing. I saw one leatherback come up and, and lay her eggs, and it was amazing. It was like seeing a dinosaur come up onto the because uh, they do it at night, you know. So you, I'd never seen anything like it. She was huge and she was beautiful, and. Um, yeah, so that was kind of it was that was kind of it. It was sort of this ongoing sort of like they're critically endangered and trying to to make it so that these um, hatchlings that have very little chance of survival have the little chance that they have to make it to the water. There's there's a lot of predators and there's and there's humans as well that will dig up eggs. Um, a lot of raccoons. Um, yeah. So it was just kind of protecting, protecting the eggs through all aspects of them coming into being. <laughs> Hope that answered your question, David. <laughs> Good to see you on there. Um, is there anybody else? I was going to see if Franklin's on there too. Do we have any more questions from them? Did anybody go? Yeah, I've got one for Rohit. Okay, cool. And uh, Rohit asks, had you planned to make a project of the juvenile blue whale viewing when driving there, or did it happen spontaneously when you arrived? I didn't plan to make a project of it at all, um, not even while I was shooting it, to be honest. Um, I brought my camera because I bring my camera with me. Um, it's not a super expensive camera. It's like a, it's, it's a nice, it's a rebel camera. <laughs> rebel, um, uh, Rebel camera, like a T5i or something. So it's not an expensive camera, but at the same time, it's my camera. So I do bring it everywhere, but I had no intention while I was there of making work. But I always have it there for the possibility. And even when I brought it with me, I knew I was bringing it with me because of where I was going and what I was going to see. And I just instinctively set up the camera at different positions and, and videoed. Um, this one being like right at the waters. I'm actually surprised this shot is so still because I was actually standing almost in the water while I was shooting it, but I had no intention of making work really, not in that moment anyway. And when I came home, I had, well, I came home, COVID happened very shortly afterwards, um, but I had other projects that I was working on, other installations and exhibitions. So I didn't even know what I was gonna do with this footage or how it was gonna come into being. And, it, and it did because yeah. of that whole like being open and uh, letting yeah. it take you where you need to go and and all of that. But um, but yeah, that's kind of how I work a lot. Is I don't know I'm going to make a project necessarily, and it just sort of comes out of my experience. 
I guess we have another question. Yeah. Okay. This is from Mercy Robinson, who is a partner at uh, South Boston Nacion. Oh, hey, Hello, Mercy. Mercy. Hello, you, hey. Um, and and uh, Mercy asks Allison, seeing the baby turtles and the whale, what I feel is the cycle of life and how human activities have impacted our biological sea life. Mm -hmm. Going from the turtles to the whale, what was your initial feeling? Um, I guess the scale is so different um, and sort of with the struggle that I'm seeing with these, these little turtles, this loss seemed like such a waste, I suppose. Um, but they both, they both have this incredible beauty that I feel like is connected to my soul and who I am. So I, I don't know, I don't know that I was thinking as much as feeling when I was making, when I was taking this work, when I was shooting this video, I was more feeling than thinking. Um, but because I fundamentally in, in my core believe that we're all interconnected, I definitely knew that there was a connection between the hatchlings and the whale, for sure. I don't know if that answers that question, but I... Um... Do you have any questions for us? Oh, is there any other questions? Do you have any questions for us or anything else you wanna share? I mean, you can, we're here, you can get, if you want a minute. Um, no, I'm just really excited to have this work here. Um, I wanna thank Michael and Greg for having me here, for creating this incredible opportunity, for giving me the liberty to do this and, and Kathleen as well for inviting me to be a part of this show, for seeing my work, for being interested in it and all of you for allowing me to do this to your wall. <laughs> well, and I think it's great because you and David really changed how you install because David created with his paintings a whole different way of installing his work and this is new for you. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that this space um, has allowed people to really experiment and push how they've shown their work, mm -hmm. even in a spatial configuration. It's a huge thing. I mean, it's a, to be able to experiment and do that. So. You know, I think that's you really activated the walls in a different way by leaning this up, and and I think um, I hope I captured it well enough from the curatorial essay. Absolutely, I think I did. Absolutely, never know. I make sure it's there. David was fine with his. Now I like just hopefully I'll do a good job for for Shea Justice. <laughs> um, but because you know it's me talking about the work and and how I see it, but I hope to hit where you are at, at and, and give different words for people to enter the work. But visually, I think this really allows people to sit and just, it makes you go quiet really when you look at this work. It's yeah. a very sombering uh, piece yeah. in that way. There's not a lot of motion. There's the motion of the water. There's yeah. the motion of the wind. There's, there's no sound, which is great. So there's that's no this other, right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, anybody else, anything else? We can, um, we're gonna, it's gonna be a wrap. <laughs> and um, I want to thank you again for Allison for being here and, and, and allowing us to show your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> oh, this Franklin. Now we see you on the Hi, screen, Franklin. Hi, Franklin. Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, then. So can we...